Hey everybody and welcome to another Bowtie Teacher video. In a recent video I predicted the topics that were going to come up in the Paper 1 HR for Edexcel IGCSE Math and I've had quite a few comments and emails asking me to do the same for the 1H papers. So I've gone through all of the, the papers that were available from 2018 and analysed that information and I'm going to present it to you so that you can study those topics that are going to come up more likely in the Paper 1 but also try to go through as many of these topics as you can so in case something comes up from the Paper 2 into the Paper 1 that you're ready for it. So let's get started. So when you put all of these things together we can see that one of the most assessed topics is rounding and it's one of those that kind of goes unnoticed and students drop a lot of the marks because they do the wrong rounding or they don't round to the correct uh, nearest pound for example so make sure that when you're doing every single question refer back when you get your answer to the question and check to see if it's 1DP, 3SF because they sometimes change what you're going to expect there for the rounding. Okay, and if you start the top left of this diagram and you work your way down towards the bottom right you'll see that some of these topics are coming up more and more often in the paper H than they do in the HR and vice versa. There is a lot of overlap between the content of the two papers. They're meant to be you know, the same but uh, there are some slight differences. So I'll put a link in the description to my other video where I go through all of the content that is the same. Okay. And then for this video here, I'll try to do the things that are specific to the H papers so that you can make your study a little bit more efficient and effective. So we can see here that the things that are different to the paper H are is that algebraic fractions is a lot higher up in the order of these things. So what I'll do is I'll put some stuff together at the, uh, later on in the video and you can, you can click into there and, and see how algebraic fractions work and what they do. Um, how to manipulate them and how to solve equations that have fractions in there. Functions is something that is a lot more prevalent in the paper H. Okay, so functions, looking at the domain, looking at the range, making sure you understand how to do inverse functions and what happens if you have a quadratic in there as well. We'll also have a look at standard form and circle theorems in a lot more detail because they're more likely to come up in the paper H than they are in the HR. Now if we go to the second page and we have a look at the paper H questions, okay, you'll see here again algebraic fractions and it has a skew there of 16 marks to 4 for paper 1 in gold. So paper 1 is gold, paper 2 is in purple and we see some differences there that I'll, I'll try to highlight as we go through the video. Transforming graphs here you can see nearly always comes up in paper 1 same as expanding triple brackets and parallel lines. These are things that are a lot more likely to come up in paper one. But also we have a big skew here for standard form. Okay, Standard form is one of those things that doesn't really appear in the HR paper as much in paper one, but it does for the paper H. So I'll go through these, these topics here in more detail now so that you can see how comfortable you are with different content but also refer back to the other video, like I say, because there's things that are the same, like ratios, uh, circle theorems a little bit, but differentiation there, um, equations of a straight line and harder probability are all things that I've covered in the other video. So you can just look back at that one as well and make sure that you're checking. I've also done a recent video on calculator usage, so you can use your calculator most effectively to try and get the most marks available. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these topics in more detail so that you can prepare for the Paper 1H. Okay, so the first topic that we're going to look at is algebraic fractions. And we see here that we have a fraction that we have to simplify. And this often brings in difference of two squares. And uh, you have to use that as, as your guide, really, because we can see that on the bottom we've got difference of two squares. So we've got 4x squared minus 2x. So effectively we have here, we have 2x squared, then we have a minus, and then we have another square number, so 5 squared. Okay, So our bracket on the denominator is going to be 2x plus 5 and 2x minus 5. That tells us that one of the, it's very likely that one of the, the brackets in the numerator is going to be 2x plus 5 or 2x minus 5 so that these can cancel. So let's just try and put in here a 2x and a 5 and see if that helps us. 
So we need to just see if this will multiply to give 2x squared and 5. So we know we need a 1 here, and to make the 2x squared, we need an x there. And then we just have to decide what the sign's going to be. So it's a negative in front of the 5, so we know we need a plus and a minus. And we can try to make negative 3. So if we put a plus 1 here, so that 2x times 1 it gives you plus 2, and then minus 5x, that will give us the 3x that we're after. And now that we have a bracket that's the same, the 2x minus 5, 2x minus 5, that will give us x plus 1 over 2x plus 5. So we've now simplified this algebraic fraction into something a little bit more manageable. So I've created an algebraic fraction here for you to simplify yourself. So pause the video and see if you can follow the rules that I've just sort of given to you there in the method and try to simplify this down into its uh, broken down form. Okay, I hope you've had a chance to do that. So let's have a look at this then. The denominator here is 9x squared minus 16. So we have a 3x all squared here and a minus and then a 4 squared here. So difference of two squares. So we're going to have a 3x plus 4 and a 3x minus 4. So we know that one of these, this isn't always the case, but it's, it's usually the case, is that we're going to have a 3x and a 4 in the numerator. So to make 3x squared, we're going to multiply by x. And to make 12, we're going to need a 3 in here. To make 5x, we're going to need a positive 9 and then a minus 4x there, so that we get our 5x. And then we can cancel these to give us x plus 3 over 3x plus 4. Okay. If you're not sure how to factorize this or this, then you can use your calculator to give you your, your values. So um, if we have our menu and we go down to our equation, polynomial degree 2, then we can put 3 in, 5 and negative 12, and we get 4 thirds and minus 3. So our bracket will be the opposite of minus 3, which is plus 3, and that will give us one of them. We can work from there, or you can work back from 4 thirds. So if x equals 4 thirds, then we can work backwards by multiplying by 3, and then minus 4 from both sides, and that gives us our 0 that we would have started with with the brackets if we went in reverse. So hopefully that will show you how to use your calculator to factorize these quadratics a little bit more easily. Okay, what about if we have to multiply these together? So for example, if we have something like uh, harder probability where they give you these algebraic fractions that you have to use and you have things like x minus 4 over x multiplied by x minus 5 over x minus 1 and that equals some number. We're just going to concentrate on the actual algebraic fractions for now. So in this case, just like when you have any fraction, so let's have um, 3 quarters times 5 eighths. We would do top times top to get 15, and bottom times bottom to get 32. So we do the same with algebraic fractions. We're going to do the top times the top, x minus 4 times x minus 5 over the bottom times the bottom, like that. And then we would start to expand these out, x squared minus 9x plus 20 over x squared minus x, like that. So when you're multiplying these algebraic fractions, that's relatively straightforward because you just do the top times the top. And sometimes, in a rare case, you might have a division of these two together. So in that case, you would just flip the second one upside down, and then times it. You may also have to solve these algebraic fractions as well. So I have one here where you have an algebraic fraction is equal to some number. That might be a fraction as well. So we're going to times both sides by the denominator to try and clear that. So we have x equals 12 brackets x plus 1. And then we would just expand this and then solve it in the normal way. So these ones where we have an algebraic fraction and some algebra on the bottom, we just multiply by the denominator. and Make sure you keep it as a bracket because 
what some students tend to do when they see these things and they're complicated, they start to say, oh, I've got an x squared here and an x squared here and, and I cancel them out like that, which you're not allowed to do. You have to factor them and see if there's any brackets that are common to both the top and the bottom. So functions is one of those topics that comes up towards the latter stages of the paper and it causes some problems for students because of the terminology but also the method of how you do these. So let's go back to, to the basics of functions and when we were in year seven and we had this sort of like number machine and we had a rule in there like times three and plus one and we put numbers into the function like one, two and three and we times it by three and add one and we'd get four, two times three plus one, seven, three times three plus one, ten. This is our input here. This is the function. This is the thing that you're actually doing to the input. And then we have an output here, which is our number. But when we get to the GCSE topic, the input is going to be our x coordinate. And the output is our y. Uh, we also shorten this output to the function of x. So the y and the function of x are both the same thing. It's the y coordinate of this function. So if you're to learn about this we also have some more terminology here which is this is the domain and this is called the range so what are the range of possible values for this so let's have a look at some examples here if i have just a simple straight line here then the domain could be any value of x this line continues on forever and our y values would also continue up to infinity and down to infinity but if we have a quadratic that goes through, say, minus 4 like that, then for every value of x that we could possibly have, so x is unlimited, x would be any real number which they put in the exam like this with this sort of strange r sign. The range would only be a number above negative 4. So the range, f of x, can only be greater than or equal to negative 4. You can't go below that number. So there's a restriction on the range here that we can't have. And when we are doing these questions for GCSE, they'll usually have something like a kind of 1 over x graph like this, 1 over x. Okay. Now, in the case where you have an x in the denominator, it's not possible to divide by zero. So when you have a graph, you actually have these things called asymptotes, where the graph kind of approaches this line and never touches. And there's one also on the x-axis as well here. Because as x gets larger and larger and larger, one divided by that will get closer and closer to zero, but never touches. So for our range, our f of x, we'll, we'll never have zero here on the y coordinate okay we'll never have zero but also for our domain we're not allowed to have x equals zero because as soon as x is zero we're doing one divided by zero which gives us a math error on our calculator and is undefined so if we have something like one over three x plus two okay then to work out the number that's not allowed, we just simply put the denominator equal to 0 and then solve that. So we get 3x equals negative 2, x equals minus 2 over 3. So you're not allowed to have x equals minus 2 over 3 in your domain because as soon as you do that, you get a number which you can't physically have, like 1 divided by 0. So minus 2 thirds times 3 is minus 2 plus 2 gives you 0. So you can't have that x value there. So that's what they mean when they're talking about excluding numbers from the domain. They've never done it for the range uh, for GCSE, but you never know that they might say to you, well, what, what about the range? And then most students won't be able to do that. And if you understand this concept, then you will be. The only other example I've seen of this is when you have a square root sign, and it asks you which values can be excluded from this domain. So you know that when you're doing square roots, you can't go below zero because as soon as you do that your calculator will say an error so this has to be positive it has to be greater than zero so if you have the square root of x plus two then we put x plus two equals zero x equals negative two 
So as soon as x is less than negative 2, those values will not be allowed. Okay, so that's the only other example I've seen of this, but usually it's a function where you have a 1 over x or x over x plus 2, and you just put the denominator equal to 0. Okay, so with our functions, don't forget that we can also have our x and our y, but this is our f of x, remember, so we can still have these minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, and refer back to my calculator video where I show you how to easily generate these on your calculator. So if you have your um, if you have your function here and you want to find out how what this graph looks like, it's useful to have, sometimes have a sketch of this so that you can get your head around what's actually going on here. But usually they'll have f of x equals 2 over 3x plus 4 or something like that. And they'll have another function which they'll call g of x and that's equal to x plus 5. Okay. And what they'll do is they'll try to put these two together in what's called a composite function. So they'll say, well, we want you to find f g x. And what that means is that you're going to do g of x first, the one that's closest to the x, so x plus 5. And then we're going to put that x plus 5 into f. So we're going to do f of x plus 5. Okay. So when you're substituting in these, we're looking for f which is 2 over 3x plus 4. And we're going to replace the x with the x plus 5 from g. So that goes in there. Wherever you see an x, you're going to replace it with x plus 5 in a bracket. And we just simplify that out. So we have 2 over 3x plus 15 plus 4. And then 2 over 3x plus 19. So they might ask you to simplify that. The next level up is when they put that equal to something. So they'll say f g of x is equal to 4. And they'll say, right, find out what the x value would have been to make this work. So once we've worked out f g of x, we put that equal to 4. So we have 2 over 3x plus 19 is equal to 4. We multiply this out like that. And then we would just solve this in the normal way. Okay, so sometimes they have a number here, sometimes they have a letter and they change it, they'll say something like f g of a equals a, and you have to work that out. You do the exact same thing, you just put the a where the x is, and then you put that equation equal to a and solve it. Okay. The next thing they ask you to do is work out inverse functions. So with inverse, what you do is you take your function, let's say it looks like that, and you reflect it on the line y equals x. Okay. So if this coordinate here is, say, 0, 4, then it would become 4, 0 here, because the x becomes the y and the y becomes the x. This one here, let's say that's minus 2, 0. Then that would become 0, minus 2. And what you find is you've got this line that's reflected on this y equals x line. Okay. How does that help us when we, when we have these functions, like we have f of x equals 2x over x minus 3? Okay, and it asks you to find the inverse function. So the way that we do this is that we reassign f of x back to y, and we then switch every x with a y, just like we did here with the x and y coordinates. So we're going to switch the x and the y's. So every time you see an x, you change it into a y and vice versa. And we then rearrange this to solve for y. So we have to clear this from the denominator, multiply it out, and then collect the y's on one side, factor the y, and then divide by the bracket. Okay, so once we've done this process of switching the x's and the y's, and then 
rearranging for y, this new y that we've done is now the inverse function, which looks like this, f minus 1 of x. So this function here will be the reflected version of the original. Okay, And it might ask you to solve f minus 1x equals something, and you just put that equal to whatever that is. Okay, The very last thing that I've seen with this is when we have a function that is in the form of a quadratic. So let's say 2x squared plus 12x plus 5. And it asks you to find the inverse. Now when you do this, you can't use the same method that we've done here because you've got two lots of x variables here. We actually have to complete the square first. So we take the 2 out of the bracket and then we complete the square on this. I'm not going to spend too much time going over that, but you would do this on your calculator and it will give you the completed square form as well. So you can make sure that you've got that. And we're just taking the minus 9 plus 2.5 here and then multiplying out everything here. So we've got 2x plus 3 squared minus 9 plus 2.5 is minus 6.5 times 2 is minus 13, I think. Let's just check that on the calculator to be sure. So we're going to do 2x squared, 12x, and 5. So we go down to our completed square. So the minus 3 is the opposite of that. And the negative 13 gives us that one. Lovely. So now that we've got it in this form for f of x, we can now replace the f of x with a y and do the same thing here. So we have y plus 13 equals 2 lots of x plus 3 all squared. Divide by 2 and then square root both sides. So we get plus or minus here and then I'm going to minus 3 from both sides to get my x value. So minus 3 plus or minus root y plus 13 over 2 equals x. Okay. So I can now switch my x and my y's at the end if I want. If I've solved for x and find my y like that, it's up to you which way around you do it. But this will be the inverse function of this quadratic. So a lot more complicated, but I saw that at the end of June 2019, I th uh, June 2019, I think, yeah. Okay, the next topic that's a lot more common in the paper 1H than in the HR is transformation of graphs. So let's just take a look at the different ways that we can transform graphs and how we can try and attack these questions. So what they'll do is that they'll give you a point on a curve on, and, and ask you to transform it in some way. So this is f of x, our function. And if you think about it, there's only a few things we can do. We can move it up, we can move it down, we can move it left and right, or we can sort of stretch it in the y direction or squash it in the y direction, or we can stretch it in the x or we can squash it in the x direction okay so there's eight different things there that we can do and we have to learn what is each one and how does that look on our function so our original function is f of x if we want to shift it up and down what we would do let's have our f of x here let's spread that out like this okay if we're going to move it up and down, what we would do is we would take a number and put it outside the brackets. Okay, So outside the brackets here, plus or minus a, let's call it a, just a, a number. If you have your f of x and then something outside the brackets, then that will shift it up. So this is going to be my a, and a positive number will shift the graph upwards, and a negative number would shift it downwards. Okay. So the question would be, what is f of x plus 3? What would that do to this coordinate here of 3 minus 4? So because it's outside the brackets, it's affecting the y. So the 3 will stay exactly the same. The minus 4 will be shifted up 3 units to minus 1. Similarly, if I had f of x minus 2, then the x-coordinate is unaffected, and the y-coordinate will be shifted down by 2. Okay, 
So that's what happens if you have a plus or minus outside the brackets that will affect the y coordinate up and down. The next one is left and right and that appears inside the bracket because inside the bracket affects x. So if I have plus or minus b here, okay, so we're going to have b here, then this is the opposite of what you think. Everything for the x is opposite to what you think it will be. So you would think that if it has a plus here and it's shifted it to the right, but it's actually the other way around. So a minus will shift the graph to the right and a plus will shift it to the left. So a question that you might get here is f of x plus 4. What would that do to our original 3 comma minus 4? So plus 4 is a shift to the left, so it's going to go left by 4, and the y-coordinate is unaffected. So I'm going to leave the y-coordinate as it is, and I'm going to shift it left by 4 to give me negative 1. So that 3 has gone down 4 units to negative 1. f of x minus 2 would be a shift to the right because it's a minus sign in there so the y coordinate is unaffected so I can always put that in easily and it's been shifted to 2 to the right from 3 so it would go up to 5 like that. The next possibility is a stretch so we're going to put a C here and the C would actually go in front of the F here okay so you might have something like 2f of x. Okay, so when we have a a number that's bigger than one, okay, so a number greater than one, that will stretch this one. So this is a number greater than one will be a stretch in the y direction, and if it's a fraction that's below one, like a half or a third, then what that does is it squashes the y coordinate down towards the x axis. So here's the x axis like that. What that's going to do is it's going to stretch the graph. If you have 2f of x or 3f of x, this is the scale factor, and the fraction, like a half or a third, is a squash in the y direction. So 2f of x, and notice that number is outside the brackets again, so it's affecting the y. So the 3 is going to stay the same. And the 2 is a scale factor, so multiply the y coordinate by 2, that would give us negative 8. Okay? And just a point here about these intersections with the x axis, when y equals 0, when you multiply that by whatever it is, like 2, 3, or a half, that stays at 0. So those uh, intersection points are like the anchors of the graph, and everything else is stretched or squashed, but those points stay exactly the same. If I have a third, f of x, then again the x coordinate stays the same and the y coordinate will be multiplied by a third, so minus four thirds. Okay, and that would be going towards the x axis like that. This number here we'll put in as d, okay, and the d goes in front of the x here. So again it's inside the bracket, so it's affecting x and it's doing the opposite of what you think. So if d is a number that's greater than 1, okay, if d is a number that's greater than 1, it's going to be a squash, okay? So it's a squash towards the y-axis. So a number greater than 1 is going to bring everything in towards the, uh, towards the y-axis. And if it's a fraction, like a half, then all of the, the points are spread away from the y-axis. Okay, so an example of that would be f of a half x. Okay, it's inside the bracket, so the y-coordinate stays the same, and the half means that you're actually doubling the distance away because the fraction sort of stretches it away. So from 3, we would double that to 6. And if we have f of 3x, for example, then that's going to bring everything closer towards the y-axis. So we're going to divide the x-coordinate by 3 to get 1. So the x-coordinate divided by 3 to get 1, and the y-coordinate stays the same, like that. So those are the sort of eight different ways that we can move graphs around and stretch them. We can also 
when we have a negative number, like f of negative x is a reflection in the y-axis and minus f of x outside the bracket, so it's affecting the y, it's going to reflect in the x-axis. So all of the y-coordinates in minus f of x will be flipped. So if you have minus 3, it becomes plus 3, and plus 3 will become minus 3. So you can see it's a reflection there. And the same for f of minus x will do that way around. Okay. So how do we link this into sine graphs, cosine graphs? And we've never seen it for a tan graph, but you never know. So what they do here is they have a, a, an original graph of, say, sine between 0 and 360. And it goes down to negative 1 and up to 1. So this is f of x is equal to sine x. Let's apply a few of these transformations to sine x. Okay. So let's do sine of 2x. Okay. So sine of 2x, if you compare it to this, we've placed the x with 2x. So we now have f of 2x. Okay. And if we refer back to this, we've got f of 2x, that's going to be a fraction, uh, a number that's greater than 1 is going to be a squash towards the y-axis. So everything here is going to be squashed towards the y-axis by a scale factor of 2. This goes through 180 here, this is 90, 1, and this is 270, minus 1. So all of the x-coordinates are going to be halved and the y coordinates will stay the same. So what that will do, if we do it down here, is you're actually going to have two waves. Okay, 180 there, 360. Because all of the x coordinates have been halved and notice it still goes up to 1 and down to minus 1. If I was to do 2 sine of x, this is now 2 f of x, 2 lots of sine x. So remember, when we have a number in front of the f, that is a stretch in the y direction, and it's greater than 1. So it's going to be a stretch scale factor 2 in the y direction. So our original curve will now be twice as high, 360. It will go up to 2 and down to minus 2. But you'll still have all of the x coordinates in the same position. Okay. If I wanted to shift this graph upwards, I could do sine x plus 1, and that would shift all of the y coordinates up by 1. So the whole graph would just go up one unit, and that would be something like this. Okay, there's 1, 2, and 0, 360, 180 like that. Okay? Sorry, 180 is there. Alright, so the whole thing has been shifted up. The last thing they may do is try to combine two of these. So let's say we did 2 sine x plus 1. Okay, we have 2 f of x, if I try to sort of line this up, plus 1. So we've got a combination of different transformations here where we're doubling all of the y's and then we're shifting everything up by plus 1. Okay, so I'd have this graph down here, we'd have 2, where is it, that one, 2 sine of x, so that one, and then I would shift everything up by plus 1. So something like that. It would go down to minus 1 and up to 3, like that. Okay, so you can combine these transformations at the highest levels and try to relate them back to this diagram here. The next topic that appears quite a lot in the 1H papers is the standard form. So let's start from the basics where we're just doing our, using our calculator to do like 5.2 times 10 to the 3 and you're converting that into a normal number. But what a lot of students don't know is that you can use your calculator like 65,000. If I press equals, I can use the shift setup and go to number format and the scientific mode 
and the number of decimal places that I want, let's just do three. If I now press equals, that will change that into 6.50 times 10 to the 4. Okay, so the calculator can actually convert these for you. If you have 750,000, press equals 7.5 times 10 to the 5. Okay, so use your calculator to do the most basic ones. Make sure you go to shift, setup, 3, normal, and number 1 to go back to normal. Okay. What we then do is we have these questions where they combine them or we're doing adding and subtracting of a standard form. So just use your calculator to turn it into a normal number. Okay, so let's do something like 3 times 10 to the 6 divided by um, 1.5 times 10 to the 3. Okay, you would use your calculator to do 3 times 10 to the 6 and you get 3 million divided by 1.5 times 10 to the 3, let's just do that on here, 1,500. And you could do 3 million, let's just use 3 times 10 to the 6, divided by 1.5 times 10 to the 3, and I get 2,000. And then it says, leave your answer in standard form. So I've got my number format, scientific, I'll just put 3, 2 times 10 to the 3. Okay, You would show some working perhaps by having a decimal point and moving it like that, but it's 2 times 10 to the power of 3. Okay. As you get to the harder standard form, this is where you have a question like 27 times 10 to the 12 n, and they say that's, let's call that p. And then they say, well, what would p to the 2 thirds be? Okay, and this is this is where students kind of look at this and go, well, I, I don't know how to do this. But when you have any number, let's say, um, let's do, I don't know, 27x to the 12, and I raise that to the power of 2 thirds, then I would take this separately and multiply it from x to the 12 times 2 thirds, like that. Okay, can you kind of see how they're linked together? What we would do here is we would split 27 to the 2 thirds, like that, and then we'd have 10 to the 12 n multiplied by 2 thirds. Okay, it doesn't matter that there's algebra in there, we just do the exact same thing. So 27 to the power of 2 thirds, we cube root it and square it, that's going to give us 9. And then we multiply the two powers in here, just like we would do with 12 and 2 thirds. So we've got 12n times 2 thirds is 10 to the power of 8n. So we've now taken this rather strange thing and raised it to the power of 2 thirds. And we've got an answer here in standard form, 9 times 10 to the power of 8n. Okay? If this number was something like 16 times 10 to the 8n, Okay, well, what would you do now? Because it's not in standard form. That number has to be between 1 and 10. Well, if we had 16 times 10 to the 8, what would you do then? You'd change this to 1.6, and then you'd raise the power to 1 more. Okay, so we do the exact same here. We do 1.6 times 10 to the 8n, and we add 1 to the power. So we just do plus 1 like that. Okay, that's as hard as it gets for standard form, where they start to combine these into strange ways. So just have a practice at some of these, and you can actually put numbers in here and ask yourself what would you do if it wasn't algebra, because that's all it is. Okay, we've got to get over that barrier of seeing the algebra there, and then just applying the same logic to what we've, we've done before. So for harder indices, let's take a look at some of the questions that you'll be expected to do in order to uh, get these marks. If we have something like... Um, 1, 2, 5, x to the 9, y to the 6 over um, a cubed, okay? And we're going to do something like minus a third. Then when you have a negative power, what we have to do is we have to flip this thing upside down and then we have a positive third like this. So this whole fraction would be flipped upside down, so we'd have 
a cubed over 1, 2, 5, x to the 9, y to the 6. Okay? If there was nothing there, like that was just a number x to the 9, y to the 6, we'd put it over 1, and then we'd have a, a 1 over like that. Okay? So that's what you would do there. And then we can now treat these separately like we would. a cubed to the power of 1 third, we would multiply those two powers together to get a to the power of 1, which is just a. And then on the denominator, we'd have 125 to the power of 1 third, so the cube root of that, multiplied by x to the 9 to the third, and then multiplied by y to the 6 to the power of 1 third. Okay, so 125 to the third, the cube root of that is 5, and then we have 9 times a third, so we'd have x to the 3, and the 6 times a third is y squared. So our final answer would be a over 5x cubed y squared. Okay, So when you're having combinations of these minus, then you have to flip the thing upside down, and then you can just carry on as you would usually do. We also have these things where we have like 3 to the n is equal to 3 to the x plus 2 over 27 to the y. And when you have these different bases here, we can't use our indices rules. We have to have everything in the same base. So we look at the smallest one, which in this case is a 3. When I'm talking about base, I'm like the big number here. 27 has to be changed into some base 3. So 27 is the same as 3 cubed. Okay. Often we have combinations of, say, 2, 8, and 4, and things like that. So we have to make this 2 to the 1, 2 cubed, 2 squared, like that. As soon as you recognize that these are all powers of each other, then you can start the question. So we're just going to change that 27 into 3 cubed like that. We just replace the 27 with 3 cubed. And we can start to work with this now because we're just applying the rules that we know because we have a 3 and a y which we're going to multiply together. And then we're doing a divide here so we're going to subtract the powers. So we've got 3 to the n is equal to 3x plus 2 divided by 3 to the 3y. And we can then subtract these powers x plus 2 minus 3y. Once we've got to that stage, we now have a 3 and a 3 on both sides. We can actually ignore the 3 because it's asking us, in the question, it'll say something like, write an expression for n in terms of x and y. So we have n is equal to x plus 2 minus 3y. That's how we approach these questions. So if we do another one here, let's just do um, 2 to the x is equal to 4 to the y over 8 to the z. Okay, And it wants an expression linking x, y, and z. Then we would say, right, 2 is the smallest base, so we're going to do 2 squared y, 2 cubed z. Okay, We can then divide these, so 2 to the 2y divided by 2 to the 3z, and we then have 2 to the x is 2 to the 2y minus 3z. So x equals 2y minus 3z, like that. Okay, This is as hard as these get. They, they, they can't really ask you anything more than this because the powers start to get too large and they're not recognizable to students. Um, but they did have one uh, in a recent paper where they did have some very large numbers and you just have to experiment with powers of 2 or 3 to see if you can get a link between those. Okay, So if you had something like, I don't know, 1024x, like that, and you had the rest, you know, 2, two, to, the, two to the z and um, 8 to the y, like that, you'd be thinking, are these powers of 2? So we have to, on our calculator, go 2 times 2, Oh, I haven't put it back out of sight. That's something for you to, to take a note of there. I didn't take it out of scientific mode. So we've got 2 times 2 times 2, and we keep going up to see if we get to 1,024 like that. Okay? So we can say, well, 2 to the power of 
8. Let's try that. That's too small. 2 to the power of 10. Yeah, that's 1024, like that. So we can now change that to 2 to the 10. So if there's any really large numbers on these, then just try to see if they're all in base 2. Or it could be a 3, or it could be a 5. Okay, so you can use trial and improvement there to, to work that out. The next topic is proportion, and this is one that uh, students really struggle with. So let's have a look at what does proportion mean. If we have two variables that are linked, like x and y, okay, then if we have a straight line relationship like this, then we would say that x and y are proportional to, to each other. y is proportional to x, okay, because they're linked to each other, okay. But what's the gradient of this? We don't know what the gradient is. So there's some sort of gradient here, let's call it k, that will link these two together, like y equals 2x or y equals 3x. So we would change this into y equals kx, like that. We change the proportional sign into equals k. And we try to find what is the link between this. We need one pair of um, coordinates that will give us the link. So in the question, they'll either say to you, um, x is equal to 4 when y is equal to 2, or they'll give you a table of values and they have a link between x and y there, and you choose like a pair of numbers here. Or they might give you the actual graph itself, and you have to just read off the values for yourself. You need that link between them so that you can work out what k is. And then once you've found out what k is, so we substitute y equals and x equals 2 and we find that k is equal to 2 okay and then it says well now you found out that k what is the formula link in these so you just replace this y equals kx with the k that you found all right if it says that y is proportional to the y is proportional to the uh, sorry y is proportional to the square of x then you have x squared, okay, but you don't know if it's 2x squared or 3x squared or 4x squared. So again, we need some information that we can read off of here that will give us that link. So we, again, we replace the proportional sign with equals kx squared, and they say, right, well, y equals 36 when x equals 2. So you replace this equals k, lots of 2 squared, divide that by and k equals 9. So we now know that y is equal to 9x squared. And we can now use that in the part b where they ask you to substitute in your values and find out what happens when y is 144 or what's the positive value of x. So you just need that link to get started. And once you've done that, it's just a case of rearranging this equation. They sometimes have y is inversely proportional to the square of x. So this is proportional to 1 over x squared. Okay, So 1 over x squared looks like this. Okay, But we again, we don't know if it's 1 over x squared or 2 over x squared. So we replace the proportional sign with y equals k times 1 over x squared. And that's just k over x squared. Okay. So if you see an inversely proportional to, it's k divided by whatever it says in the question, the square of x, the cube of x, the square root of x. You just have to read that information off, generate this equation, find k. Let's say k is 2, so y equals 2 over x squared. And then you use that in part b to find out a new piece of information. So proportion is relatively straightforward. Once you understand how this is all linked together with the equals k thing, you just find k, put the formula back in, and then use the formula in part b to find out some new information. Okay, for the last topic we're going to take some time to look at circle theorems and see if we can understand using GeoGebra what it is that is causing us some problems with these, with these circle theorems. So we're going to do a circle with a center here and something that we need to be aware of with circles is that when we draw a line across here, let's just draw a segment across here, what that does is that splits the circle into two segments. Okay, The biggest sort of part of this circle between CD and this outer border is called the major segment, which is bigger. And this smaller part here is the minor segment. OK, 
okay? But what happens is, is when we create angles in these two segments, some interesting things happen here. So I'm just going to create an angle in here, like that. I've created an angle in this minor segment, okay? And then if I create another one, and I join these up, then what you find is that these angles here that are in the same segment are equal to each other. So if I just drag this down here, you can see that they overlap exactly and they will be the exact same angle. So they're angles in the same segment because if I use a chord and split this, I could have this chord kind of anywhere really. I could have that there and there and these two would still be in the same segment and those would be in the same segment there. So let's check to see if these two are the same and you can see that yes, they are indeed the same. Okay. So that's one of the ones where we're talking about segments that students kind of find difficult. We have a new circle here with a tangent at B. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, a point on this line, just here, and another segment between B and the circumference. So hopefully you can see that I've created a chord between B and D. And if I just measure the angle between this here, B, C, D, well, D, C, B here, then we have a 41.8 degree angle. And you can see that this is in the minor segment here. If I create another angle with the major segment, it doesn't matter where it is, where I create this angle. So I can go from here down to here. It doesn't matter where I put that. This angle here will always be the same. And it will always be the same as that 41.8 there. So if I measure these two angles in here between these two lines, you can see I've got 41.8 again. So I've taken a tangent, I've made an angle in the minor segment, and the angles in the same segment, sorry, angles in the opposite segment are equal. So we call that the alternate segment theorem, because this minor segment here, and I've created an angle in the major segment, they're in the alternate segment and they are the same. Okay. If I put a point onto this line here and measure this angle. So from E, B, S, then I have 62.8. And I've created a different chord here. So this is now the minor segment. E to B has created this minor segment here. So that means that the angle in the opposite or the alternate segment will also be the same. So the angle between here and here is also 62.8. So I can move this around here and you can see it doesn't change, okay? But these two here, 58.9, are staying the same because they're in the alternate segment. Edexcel seemed to really want to get students to understand this because it's quite abstract, okay, talking about alternate segments. But hopefully this demonstration has shown you how the alternate segment theorem works and what it is and, and how you can actually use this to answer questions, okay? The other circle theorems we have, we've got, um, let's put another circle here, the one where we have the point in the middle, and we go from here to here, and then we go to the circumference, like that. So let's just have a look at measuring those angles there. So we have here to here, 91, and here to here, 45.5. So we can move those points around and it doesn't change. Okay? So that stays exactly the same. And this is this is one where students think sometimes we have this. Okay? And they think that that's the kind of bow tie shape, the alternate uh the angles in the same segment I showed you at the beginning. But when they're connected to the middle like that, that's just a a, a rearranged version of this. Okay? With the arrowhead. So angles at the center are double angles at the circumference. Okay, don't get confused with that one because that happened in, I think, January 2018. If we draw another circle and put a tangent on this, then we connect that to the, the middle. Then you can probably see here that we've got a 90 degree angle within that part there, so at L. So a tangent to the center 
gives you a 90 degree angle and that opens up a whole load of possibilities with the questions because they can now start asking you about Pythagoras, trigonometry, those sorts of things. Okay, um, do another circle and let's try and draw a segment through the center. Okay, and now when we connect any other point on the circle, so we can put a point anywhere, when we connect this diameter here to this point on the circle, that will give us a right angle as well. Okay, so I can move this point anywhere, sorry P, I can put that anywhere, and that will still stay as a right angle wherever it goes. Okay, so I hope that that run through of the different topics that are likely to come up in the 1H paper has been useful to you. Like I say, the most effective thing you can do is to try to study all of those topics that I showed you on that first diagram with all the colours and the, and the blocks to represent the sort of proportion of the, the questions and the marks that are available. So try to work your way from the top left down to the bottom right and try and cover as many of those things as possible because it's hard to predict with such a small number of papers what's going to happen. It's best to try and study as much as you can and then as soon as we have that paper one completed, we'll know exactly what's going to come up on the paper two with pretty pretty good degree of accuracy. So stay tuned for that video where I'll go through the paper two and hopefully have a mark scheme available for the paper one, an unofficial one, so you can get an understanding for the sort of scores that you're getting and the grade that you're currently working at. Okay, good luck in your exams.